But 21-year-old Mark Zuckerberg turned his little web experiment into a very big business. I view our responsibility as not just building services that people like, but building services that are good for people and good for society. Facebook has squashed potential threats. You've got families whose children are either severely harmed or gone. It's another major setback for Facebook. Well, still no word from Mark Zuckerberg and the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal. Let me ask you this. There's families of victims here today. Have you apologized to the victims? Would you like to do so now, Mr. Zuckerberg? Why? Why should your company not be sued for this? For a long time, the prevailing narrative about Zuckerberg was that he's a robot and doesn't have emotions and steals your data. This past year especially has been quite eventful for Mark Zuckerberg. He created Facebook, as you all know, which is now known as Meta, a huge company in social media. But a year ago, even the people who invested in his company were upset with him. They thought he was ruining the main part of his social media business by spending too much money on creating the metaverse, a digital world that at that time seemed like a fantasy to many. When Meta announced it wasn't making as much money as expected in last year's earnings reports, its stock value dropped significantly and people were very disappointed in Zuckerberg. That's when the narrative for Zuckerberg had reached its lowest. However, things had turned around in the past year. Meta, which connects 3.1 billion people daily through Facebook, Instagram and WhatsApp and makes money by selling ads, is now doing much, much better. On October 25th, the company said it had made $34.1 billion in just three months, which is 23% more than the same time period last year. This increase is the biggest for Meta since the online surge during the COVID-19 pandemic. Its profits more than doubled to $11.6 billion. Since the low point last year, Meta's stock value has gone up 250%. But here's an interesting insight which we've recently figured out. A reason their increased expenditure and lower profits in the time period where their stock had hit a new low. In a conversation between Nat Friedman and Daniel Gross, one thing stood out. What was said is that one thing that's underrated is that the nadir that happened, which is the low point that happened with their stock price, people forget the driver of it was not Meta Reality Lab. People already knew the cost of that. It was their CapEx expenditures, which was their one-time expenses in infrastructure, which were going up massively. So I wrote at the time, this is actually, they need to be investing in CapEx. This AI stuff is super important. The profitability was actually inflated for a few quarters because they were selling chips they had already written off. But Meta bought up all these chip orders, so they got into all the GPUs, which are the graphic processing units, the units required for AI processing, before everyone else did. And they revealed last quarter, they had this astronomical fleet of GPUs because of that specific quarter. The quarter they got killed in the stock market was actually one of the single most important investments they had made for the next five years. And they ended that conversation with saying, don't bet against Zuck. But right after Zuck resurrected the business with all the open source AI stuff that they come out with, the media started again by talking about how immoral a person he is by bringing up something he did 20 years ago. In fact, and I quote, if you had to capture Silicon Valley's dominant ideology in a single anecdote, you might first look to Mark Zuckerberg, sitting in the blue glow of his computer some 20 years ago, chatting with a friend about how his new website, the Facebook, had given him access to realms of personal information about his fellow students. They then brought up a chat which we've seen many times before from many different media organizations, and they use this again and again to show how Zuck is such a villain. Zuckerberg, yeah, so if you ever need info about anyone at Harvard, just ask. I have over 4,000 emails, pictures, addresses, SNS. The friend says, what? How do you manage that one? And Zuckerberg says, people just submitted it. I don't know why. They trust me. Dumb <laughs> Facebook, now Meta, has become an avatar of all that is wrong with Silicon Valley. Its self-interested role in spreading global disinformation is an ongoing crisis. In Facebook's early days, Zuckerberg listed revolutions among his interests. This was around the time that he had a business card printed with, I'm CEO. The interesting thing is that very few of these writers have actually run a social media network. I can tell you that on any content moderation decision that you take, you have one side of your platform that will agree and the other side that will disagree. Take misinformation with the Israel-Palestine war as an example. When one side puts up a photo, nobody knows if the photo is real or AI generated. Only the person who put it up does. 
Sometimes, even the person who puts up that image does not know if it's real or AI generated. Now, if Facebook takes it down, this side will complain and say it is censoring information. If they keep it up, on the other hand, the other side will say, hey, this is misinformation. How can you allow the platform to have misinformation? What I've learned over many, many years of just watching the Twitter battle play out is that what people actually mean when they say, don't show misinformation, is show me my side, don't show any other side. And with social media, that is the real battle. Absolutely nobody can agree on what is the truth and what is lies. Not even extremely smart people. But let's go back to the character flaw argument that Mark Zuckerberg is some crazy megalomaniac and he really wants to take over the world and stuff like that. You know, I meet so many 19, 20 year old founders by virtue of what I do. And most, if not all, if they end up getting early success like Zuck when he was 19, they are extremely arrogant. In fact, when you're 19, 20, you have to be a little arrogant going after building a business like Facebook because it's an extremely hard problem to even win in the first place. Early success also comes with arrogance and thinking you are beyond other people. Like I said, it's almost inevitable for most who become successful early. And that card saying, I'm CEO, most of you reading this who are very young would have thought, oh, that's such a cool thing to have. Because the first time you become CEO and you raise money, you feel really cool. You feel like you've made it, right? The word for that is immaturity. Because let's face it, most people who think like that are actually pretty immature. But the entire point of immaturity is that one day you do become mature. And I think Mark Zuckerberg has had so many battles since that day, 20 years ago. And today, that's kind of unfair to go back to something he did 20 years ago and say, look, look, he was a bad guy then. Hey, so I'm going to interrupt you from the video for about a minute. Now, about a year ago, I was occasionally involved with a YouTube channel that I think is a laugh riot that has slowly evolved into a pretty kick-ass infotainment channel. Full disclosure, it's run by my wife and they are now known in the industry for really high quality editing. Not only did they start this channel, they also started a video mastery cohort where they taught video editing and the science of how to make a perfect video for YouTube over a three-month cohort. But what's different between AVTV and any other course is they're very focused on placements and outcomes. In fact, they've trained over 1,700 video editors so far and 80% of the students that sat for placements actually ended up getting a job. The average placement amount was over 4 lakhs an annum and many top employers in India consistently hire from them, including individuals like Nikhil Kamath, Raj Shamani, Tanmay Bhatt, Varun Dugirala and many others. And at the same time, businesses like Unacademy, Physicswala, Zero Da, Zoho and so much more. This was an underrated, non-mainstream role that is suddenly starting to become mainstream. And over the last one year, we've also seen the salary range for this continuously increase. Because as you know, where there's an audience that's continuously scrolling content, there is also supposed to be a supply and AVTV is creating that supply. So if you're looking for a new job, a career switch, or you're just looking to learn video editing for fun and be part of this ecosystem or become a creator, this is the right path for you. They're doing a free webinar to tell you a little bit about the cohort and also show you a few tricks on making a high quality video. So even if you don't buy anything, definitely join the webinar because you get to learn a thing or two. And even if you're outside of India, you can join this webinar, you can learn from it, and you can also join the cohort and be eligible to jobs. Geographies are no longer barriers. Now back to the video. From what most people can see, the trials and tribulations of being in the media light and having your every move scrutinized has actually made him a much better person. Now, I'm not at all defending any of the things he did when he was young. It's wrong to talk about your users like that. I am very sure you can take almost every person who looks at something that Zuckerberg did 20 years ago and points at it as, oh, I'm better than this person, go through their lives, and I'm very sure you'd find at least one or two instances where you could look at that from the light of, oh, this person has done a bad thing. But that's the point. Even if you did something when you were 18 or 19 or 20, and you've been through 10 or 20 or 30 years and you've learned from it, then all is good. The entire point of humanity is redemption. And now it is pretty obvious that people are using him as a scapegoat. If you watched his testimonial in the Senate, when he was asked to apologize to everyone, it was clear this was just politicians looking to drag someone in the mud for popularity. Because one of the arguments was that children are becoming addicted and are doing bad things on your platform. If you go with that argument, then you definitely also have to ban gun makers or cigarette makers first. Newspapers too. A lot of television today shows sexual activity and people killing each other and whatnot. And if you really stretch the argument, then you have to ban the US government if any citizen of the United States commits a crime. And unlike governments, Facebook is actually free to use. Governments charge you money to be on the streets. And the problem isn't one of actually moderating the content, the problem is of agreeing 
what is acceptable content and what is not because people are so divided on every single thing today on social media. Forget about Facebook, even judges in the US can't agree on what is right and wrong. But over many years, I've come to see this in very different light. I feel like this is an arena. Because before the era of social media, where people just watched their TVs or read the news, any individual who wanted to say something had to go through mainstream media. You'd actually have to call up the TV and say something or something you said would be in the newspaper snippet. So today, actually, for the first time, all of us are spectators, but we're also spectators with the voice. And the rules of this arena actually follow the rules of a very interesting little TV show. That TV show is called World Wrestling Entertainment. That's right, the WWE. Ever since social media and the fact that anyone can put up a video, the world as I see it, social media as I see it, has become the WWE. In professional wrestling, there are two terms that are used to denote types of characters. The first term is the term heel and the other one is called face. They used to describe two distinct types of characters or personas that wrestlers embody to play out stories and rivalries in the ring. A heel is essentially the villain or the bad guy. In wrestling storylines, they engage in underhanded tactics, break the rules, and often behave in a way that is designed to make the audience dislike them. The heel's role is to create conflict and make the audience root for their opponent. On the other hand, there's something called the face, which is short for baby face. This term refers to the hero or good guy in wrestling storylines. Faces are the wrestlers whom the fans are meant to support and cheer for. They fight fairly, respect the rules, and show sportsmanship. Faces often overcome various obstacles, including the villainous schemes of heels to triumph or seek justice within the storyline. In fact, the most important thing for a babyface to have is the ability to be relatable to the audience, while all the heels are completely unrelatable to the audience. This dynamic between heels and faces is central to professional wrestling storytelling. What it does is it creates a clear narrative for the audience to get invested in. This is the bad guy, this is the good guy. The reason I mentioned clear narrative is because in real life, nobody is truly black or white. We're all shades of gray. We all have flaws and we all have good parts. But audiences want clear narratives from the media. Is this guy good? Please tell me if he's good. Is this guy bad? Tell me. I don't want to make my decisions on whether the person is good or bad. You tell me. And sometimes the details don't really matter. All of us, when the Cambridge Analytica thing happened, we all went, oh, scam, privacy, data leakage, thief, scammer. And the media portrayed it like that. But do you know what actually happened? Based on what the media said, they knew it was a scandal and that Facebook was a bad company and Mark Zuckerberg was a bad person. But I will tell you what happened, exactly what happened. In the 2010s, personal data belonging to millions of Facebook users was collected by British consulting firm Cambridge Analytica, predominantly to be used for political advertising. You know, what Cambridge Analytica had done was that they made an app, which is sort of like a quiz, where they were testing you on your psychological profile. And based on that, they were selling that data. Not Facebook, but Cambridge Analytica was selling that data to government officials. Now, a lot of people, when they found out, went to Facebook and said, this is a data breach. But Facebook officials, arguing that those who took the personality quiz originally consented to give away their information. It was a third-party app. It was not a Facebook app. And anyone with even five brain cells knows that in that era, Facebook allowed absolutely anyone to make third-party apps. When Cambridge Analytica signed up with Facebook, they said that, hey, we're going to use this data for research and then lied to Facebook about it and then ran political ads to that audience. If some random app on the iOS app store takes your data and runs away with it, it's like blaming Apple and calling it an Apple scandal. Even though Apple has a review system, it is very easy to get past the review system and steal users' data if the users voluntarily give you that data. For a long time, no matter what Mark Zuckerberg did, People would still call him a thief, fraud, even the media really jumped on it. They had made him the heel of the real world. Even during that Apple-Facebook battle with advertising, where Apple banned Facebook's targeted ads, followed by launching their own ad platform, people still blamed Zuckerberg and praised Apple. But here's the thing, life really mimics fiction. See, in WWE, wrestlers may switch between being a heel and a face through their careers based on storylines and audience reactions a process known as a heel turn or a face turn. And as you all know, for a long time, Mark Zuckerberg has been the heel. Then he realized something, the golden rule of the WWE. If you want to turn from heel to face, which is if you want to turn from a bad guy to a good guy, all you need to do is to be relatable. People didn't like or dislike him because of his business decisions. He just seemed like an unrelatable guy, somebody that you really don't see yourself as. 
But you see, a lot of people, they want to see themselves in who they're rooting for. And very few people could see themselves inside Zuck because I definitely don't want to be that person and everything about that person disgusts me. That was the main problem. And he realized that changing his PR narrative to face would be valuable to the business too. So he made the face turn. He became relatable. He went to jujitsu. He started raising cattle at a ranch somewhere. He started putting out content directly to the public. When the Apple Vision Pro came out, he decided to make a video on it. And the public perception of that video was that here was a CEO with billions of dollars sitting in front of a camera telling the world why his product was better than the competitor's product. With artificial intelligence, instead of taking the closed route that OpenAI and a bunch of other companies took, he decided to make everything open source. Llama 2 is open source. And it's not just Llama 2. Their research arm has released so many different open source AI tools that the developer community now really likes and respects Zuckerberg. More than anything, he realizes that there's going to be a straight up battle between Meta and Apple at some point, and he lost the last battle. Despite the fact that he had the platform on mobile, Apple had the bigger platform, which is iOS, and Facebook had to play by all of iOS's rules, which is why he moved into hardware and said, with the next platform, which is headsets, I don't want to play by Apple's rules anymore. And he was okay with flipping a finger to all of his investors, telling them, hey, I am going to bet on the long term, because if we own the hardware, we can be the next Apple. If Apple wins the hardware and we continue to build software, we will always be smaller. But mainly, till now, his story was told by the media. Remember, most news travels on Instagram, Facebook and WhatsApp, all three of which he controls. If he was a dictator, why would he allow them to come on his platform and talk shit about him? But he still let that happen. But then he realized what a lot of other founders have realized. You can just skip the media and go direct. So Zuckerberg decided to go direct. He became an influencer. By becoming relatable and putting more of his life in front of other people, in front of the audiences like us, the videos he's been putting up, the live stream he does, now we can see all of this on our feed. And whenever an opportunity or meme came by, like the cage fight with Elon, Zuck jumped on the opportunity. And that started the resurrection of Mark Zuckerberg. Because see, from my perspective, the truth is that Zuck has always been a business and social media genius. The Twitter account, Mostly Borrowed Ideas, has a great thread on his achievements so far and why many people are still long on Zuck. At the age of 19, Zuck founded Facebook in 2004. Between 2004 and 2007, here are the list of companies that made an attempt to buy Facebook. Friendster, Google, three times. The Washington Post, Viacom, three times. MySpace, News Corp, NBC, AOL, Microsoft, Yahoo twice. In fact, Yahoo was the first to offer a billion dollars, which is 50 times sales for Facebook in 2006. Zuck's response? This is kind of a formality, just a quick board meeting. It shouldn't take more than 10 minutes. We're obviously not going to sell here. Why? He said that Yahoo had no definite idea about the future. They did not properly value things that did not exist. They were, therefore, undervaluing the business. Zuck would have received $250 million by selling Facebook at that point. Think about the belief one needs to say no to that for a 22-year-old. Was it purely financial? Is it because Yahoo's ticket wasn't big enough? What Zuck said was that I would only use the money to start another social network and I like the one I have. Think about all the social media sites that failed before Facebook and you have slightly less than $1 billion on the table and most of your colleagues are threatening to leave. Yes, at that point, a lot of people at Facebook were threatening to leave. Who would say no to that? Zuck did. And he ended it with one line, right? Which is, it's about mission. One year before Facebook's IPO, Google launched Google Plus. And it was like a David versus Goliath battle. Google's profit was many times Facebook's revenue. One month before Facebook's IPO, Zuck bought Instagram. And this was seen by everyone in the market as a really bad move. According to the thread, Zuck called the Instagram guys over, negotiated the deal in 48 hours and acquired them for a billion dollars on April 09, 2012. Sequoia, who had invested money recently, doubled their money in 5 days. Facebook 100 x their money in 6 years. You might think that acquiring Instagram was a no-brainer and it was the obvious decision considering it was going to be so big, but many others in the social media space passed on it. Jack Dorsey, for example, made a pass. He didn't want to buy it in March 2012. Instagram had 13 employees and zero revenue when Facebook bought them. You can look in the past and say Instagram is so big, but that time to make that decision required courage. And especially when Facebook's about to IPO, when the entire public is watching, he did not care. He made that decision anyway. In fact, there were a lot of questions after their IPO whether they'll even survive in a mobile world. In 2012, their mobile revenue was zero. 
But by 2019, on the back of Instagram, $60 billion. Facebook, in fact, now owns four of the five most used social apps. Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, and Messenger. Yes, Messenger is considered a separate app. The best part, Zuck is still really young. He's still in his 30s. Zuck is one of the few founder CEOs to still be around. Everyone else has handed the CEO role to somebody else. By playing the Android narrative with the Quest and the open source narrative with AI, he's playing out this Robin Hood character and it's working out for him. And all that nonsense investors gave him about the metaverse for the stock crashing, those same investors are hailing Apple like some genius company for doing the same thing at many more times the price. So all I have to say for everyone watching is there are a lot of lessons from Zuck's face turn and the entire world is tuned in. In fact, the era of the founder influencer is just beginning. And for Mark Zuckerberg, he's playing one of the most important story when it comes to the land of stories. He's playing the comeback story. I want to leave you with a reel I saw on Instagram and this reel brings out emotions in almost everyone who watches it. Because now that he's relatable, many people now see a small piece of themselves inside Mark Zuckerberg. If there's redemption for him, there's redemption for me. That's it for me. I'm going to leave you with a reel. Bye. You know what the greatest story is? It's the comeback story. Imagine yourself, a wounded soul with a broken confidence in having lost it all. But then, you pick yourself up. You rise from the ashes and the pits of anxiety and depression. You heal both physically, mentally, and emotionally. You get fitter, leaner, faster, and more mentally resilient. Against all odds, you vanquish your inner demons. So you must remember, the comeback is always stronger than the setback.